And with Lenin's arrival begins a whole new stage in the Russian Revolution. Lenin presented a blueprint for revolutionary actions based on his own version of Marxist theory. These ideas are called the April Theses. So according to Lenin, it was not necessary for Russia to experience a bourgeois revolution before it could move towards socialism. And this is something that is deemed essential by orthodox Marxists. Instead, Russia would move directly to socialism. And Lenin maintained that this would occur with Soviets of workers, soldiers, and, petty, and peasants. So they're ready-made instruments of power in Lenin's mind. So all that those Bolsheviks need to do is gain control of these groups. Then they can use them to overthrow the provisional government, which is currently dominated by middle-class liberal Democrats. Now at the same time, the Bolsheviks also articulated the discontent and the aspirations of the Russian people. They promised to end the war. They promised the redistribution of land to peasants. They promised to transfer the factories and industrial uh, um, works from capitalists to committees of workers, and to transfer the government power from the provisional government to these sort of um, groups of workers, so to the Soviets. How does this play out? Well, the Bolsheviks set out to win over the masses to their program and to gain a majority in the Soviet of Petrograd, the Soviets of Petrograd and Moscow. And this provisional government just struggles to maintain control of the country against overwhelming obstacles. The military situation is deteriorating badly. And on March 1st, the Bolsheviks issue, this did not, unfortunately, did not come out very well. Uh, but if anyone's interested, I have electronic copies of these, um, of these uh, um, documents. So the Bolsheviks issue something called Army, uh, Army Order Number no. One, which basically encourages the military, the soldiers, military forces to remove their officers and replace them with elected representatives of the lower ranks. Very, very quickly, Army Order Number no. One leads to the collapse of military discipline and it creates chaos. At the same time, you have the breakdown of law and order in the countryside. Peasants are seizing land from so-called nobles. And this is ad hoc, and at this stage it's not legal, but it's unstoppable. Factory workers are taking control in the cities and they're exacting vengeance on managers. So you've already got a, a sort of a cauldron of violence happening. In events, referred to as the July days, lead to a setback for the Bolsheviks, but also more violence. So in June, Kerensky, um, who had actually become the prime minister of the provincial government, he orders a military offensive, despite low troop morale, and despite a military situation that doesn't bode well. This is unsuccessful, but he'd done it to reassure the conservatives and the moderates that military discipline had been restored after order number one, but also convinced the allies that Russia was remained to committing in the or to, was remained committed to winning the war. So at this stage the moderates become increasingly tied to World War I. On July 3rd, 1917, the Bolsheviks rose in insurrection. Workers and soldiers rally against continued war, shouting the Bolshevik slogan, all power to the Soviets. And if you listen, here's one soldier's account of the enthusiasm at a meeting of the Petrograd Soviet. Quote, a young soldier burst through the flimsy barriers at the front doors and rushed to the center of the hall. Without asking for the floor or for permission to speak, he raised his rifle above his head and shook it, choking and gasping as he shouted the joyful news. Comrades and brothers, I bring you brotherly greetings from the lower ranks of my entire regiment. 
All of us to the last man are determined to join the people against the cursed autocracy and swear to the people's cause to the last drop of our blood. However, Lenin and the Bolsheviks here, after the insurrection, suffer a major setback. The protests are diffused when documents are released that, that um, accuse Lenin of actually being a spy. This is later debunked, but it's effective at the time. Many Bolsheviks go into hiding or they're arrested and, and Lenin himself is forced to flee to uh, Finland or face arrest. Nevertheless, the days of the provincial government, provisional government, it's not a good slip, the provisional government are numbered. Many liberals have resigned from the cabinet because they're displeased with Kerensky. So politics in Petrograd are becoming increasingly polarized and no moderation is, is possible. After an unsuccessful coup attempt, which you can read in Merriman, fearful of counter-revolutionary forces, Kerensky then releases the Bolsheviks from prison and he actually turns to the Petrograd Soviet for help. So the power and the influence of the Bolsheviks begins to grow rapidly. They begin to win elections. And Lenin returns to Russia overnight in disguise on the night of October 10th, 11th. Lenin in disguise. He believed that October 1917, that Russia was ripe for the revolution and for the overthrow of the, by this stage, desperately, desperately weak provisional government. By October, the Bolsheviks had achieved a, ma a majority in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets. And the number of party members, Bolshevik party members, has actually grown from 50,000 to 240,000. Lenin himself actually faced serious opposition within the Bolshevik ranks, but he manages to gain support for his plan to seize power. Critically, Lenin needed to seize power in the name of the Soviets. So in other words, in the name of the people. Crucial for this was Leon Trotsky, a radical revolutionary who was the chairman of the Petrograd Soviet. Lenin is concerned that the revolution's in danger because the Petrograd garrison is actually due to go back to the front. So they need insur insurrection now. The uprising itself is led by the Military Revolutionary Committee that's formed by Trotsky on October 16th. During the night of October 24th, this committee gains neutrality or the support of garrison units. And the pro-Soviet and pro-Bolshevik forces take control of Petrograd. They control strategic points, the telegraph, the railway, the bridges. The provisional government itself quickly collapses. Now, there's little bloodshed in Petrograd itself, but that's not the case in some of the other cities. There is bloodshed and there is violence in Moscow. Some of the key ministers in the provisional government are arrested. And Kerensky himself is able to flee. Revolution is announced on the night of October 25th, and the new Soviet government is called the Council of People's Commissars, with Lenin at its head. So the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries, they leave and they're relegated to quote, the ash heap of history, according to Trotsky. Now, Lenin realized that to secure power, he needed to win mass support as quickly as possible. So he tries to do this by fulfilling Bolshevik pro pro promises. On the regime's first day in power, he declares that all land will be nationalized and turned over to local committees to distribute. 
This move, of course, assured the Bolsheviks of peasant support, especially against the attempt of former landlords to restore their power. Les Lenin also promised to meet the demands of urban workers by claiming that he would turn over control of the factories to worker committees. But most pressing of all was that Lenin had, of course, promised peace. This, he realized, however, was not going to be any easy task, especially given the humiliating losses um, that a Russian territory that peace would entail. Ultimately, however, he felt he had little help, or little choice. So in March 1918, the new communist government signed the Treaty of brest litovsk with Germany. We talked about a couple, or I guess last week. So all in all, it loses parts of eastern Poland, the Ukraine, Finland, the Baltic provinces. A quarter of what had made up Imperial Russia. But to his critics, Lenin argued that such losses really didn't make any sort of difference because the spread of socialist revolution across Europe would soon make this treaty irrelevant. Of course, we know that the treaty did become irrelevant, but not due to a socialist revolution. There were, however, new obstacles for the new Bolshevik regime in Russia. Although Lenin had ended Russia's involvement in World War I, his promise of peace wasn't fulfilled. Instead, Russia descends into civil war. Or perhaps more accurately, into civil wars, because there's sort of various wars in different parts of the country. Various civil wars in different parts of the country. Why? Well, despite the working class popularity of the communists, there was also great opposition to the new regime. But this opposition didn't come only from groups that had been loyal to the Tsar, but it came from upper class liberals and moderate socialists who didn't share Lenin's approach, didn't share the justification of violence, and the idea of, of complete socialist revolution. There's ongoing grain requisitions, which anger the peasants, which is, the peasants are a large base of support for Lenin. And you see the pro, the, in the practice of grain requisitions, that dates back to the Tsarist regime. So there's this idea of ongoing force and violence that continues on during the beginning of the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Bolshevik regime. There's also global antagonism towards the Bolsheviks. They end the war, which Britain, France, and the US viewed as sort of leading them in the, leading them in the lurch. The regime refuses to pay debts. And of course, other countries have a fear of communism because communists promise world revolution. Soon, too, thousands of Allied troops were sent to different parts of Russia in the hope of bringing Russia back into the Great War. So as a result, the Bolshevik army, known as the Red Army, found themselves fighting on many fronts between 1918 and 1921. First, the Bolsheviks were threatened by an anti-Bolshevik or white force from Siberia to the east. Attacks of anti-Bolsheviks then came from the Ukraine in the southeast and from the Baltic region. By mid-1919, white forces under General Anton Venikin swept through the Ukraine and advanced almost to Moscow. However, despite some major advances, the white forces had been defeated by 1920. The Ukraine was retaken. So how had Lenin and the Bolsheviks triumphed over what seemed to be an overwhelming force? For one thing, the Red Army became a well-disciplined and formidable fighting force. Actually, I should have looked that up for you. This is the Red Army under Trotsky. It's his organizational genius that, or, that, that, um, that turns this army into such a, such a fighting force. 
He was rigid on discipline. Soldiers who deserted or refused to obey orders were executed. And he also uh, utilized, sometimes forcibly, older Tsarist officers. So you've got the Red Army, you've got disunity among opposing forces. You've also got the fact that the communists instituted a policy of war communism. Key aspects of this are class ideology, state control of the economy, and the use of terror. The nationalization of banks and industries and the centralization of administration is under the Bolsheviks. So it's done in a rather ad hoc manner in the summer of 1918 onward. And they end up using managers and factories. So this is something very different than the workplace democracy that workers were promised. State grain monopoly continues on. Forcible requisitions of grain from the peasants. This is a food squad leaving for the countryside. So the peasants face tribulations from both the white forces and the red forces, just like they had in Tsarist times. But at least the Bolsheviks represent something new, rather than this idea of going backwards. However, another Bolshevik, a significant instrument, was what you might call revolutionary terror. The Bolsheviks set up a new secret police known as the Cheka in 1918. And they function from 1918 onward. They were originally set up to root out the black market. But the Cheka becomes a tool of repression and it ends up being used against thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of Russians. The Cheka sought the destruction of all opponents of the regime. There are thousands of executions. And this is sort of on a class basis as well, because the bourgeois is singled out. According to one Cheka officer, quote, the first question you should put to the accused person are, to what class does he belong? What is his origin? What was his education? And what is his profession? And these should determine the fate of the accused. Internal estimates estimate about 13,000 Russians died during the Civil War, but some historians argue it was as high as 250,000. In the end, the communists had succeeded in retaining control of Russia by 1921. And during the course of the Civil War, the Bolshevik regime had managed to transform Russia into a bureaucratically centralized state dominated by one single party. Nonetheless, neither the revolution nor the civil war produced the ultimate goal that Lenin had sought, which was, quote, was a global revolution. So the chaos of World War I creates conditions for a radical regime. But this doesn't mean that the radicals knew what they wanted. Lenin and the Bolsheviks had to feel their way through the revolution, sometimes using class-based Marxist categories, to obtain what they wanted, so ideology, but other times by being pragmatic. So war communism is a mix of ideology and, and pragmatism. The revolution and the civil war is a formative experience for Russia. It's often, or had been, sort of classified as a legendary heroic time. Of course, others describe it as an anti-heroic time. For some, war communism becomes real communism. And you'll see this in your readings for next week when we look at the uh, dystopian novel by Zemyatin. Zemyatin actually experienced the 1905 revolution in Russia, 1917 revolution, and the Civil War. So you can see how his experiences shape his view of where the state's headed, and to a certain degree, depicts Stalinism. Okay, so have a great